Welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline Podcast. I am your host, Shana Terrell, educator activist dedicated to the lifelong struggle for freedom and liberation for my people. Welcome back to all my co-conspirators here who continue to watch and support us week after week. And our new supporters that are in here listening to this episode, we thank you. Today's show theme is Building the Black Educator Pipeline and Black Male Leaders Impacting Education. Black men, stand up, show up, and show out. Shout out to all of you who are already out here doing the work. So today we will be discussing the impact of Black male educators and how they are disrupting the school to prison pipeline for our children. So with that, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Archie Moss Jr. Welcome, sir. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Listen, we are excited for you to be here, okay? One thing I can say is uh, my team and I, we always look for like dope people to be on the show. And when we saw you up on Ellen, baby, we was like, we got to have <laughs> one. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yes. All the work that you're doing, like salute to you and welcome. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to start off. We always ask our guests to tell us a little bit about yourself. What can you share about your work past and present? What should we know about Dr. Archie? Oof. Uh, well, I don't have all day, so I'm, I'm going to keep it a little brief. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will just say I was originally born and raised in Miami, Florida, and so I have lived in so many different cities in my life and felt like I've had been able to have an impact on the lives of, of youth and children in every aspect. And so when I went to the University of Florida um, for undergrad, I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer because mm. growing up, you know, had working parents that just worked. But in my mind, it was like, I want to make sure that the, as much work as I saw my parents put in, I want to make sure I could give back to them. So I went out and I was like, you know, I'm going to be a lawyer because, you know, lawyers make money. So I'm going to school to become a lawyer. So I make lots of money so I can give back to my parents to give everything that I feel like they deserve. And I realized I didn't really want to do that. That's not where my passion was. Was That's not what was driving me to do this work. And so um, I ended up doing applying for Teach for America to be a teacher. So I was a Teach for America, Charlotte 2011 core member, teaching sixth and seventh grade mathematics at Whitewater Middle School, which was the home of the Gators, which was like, I feel like it was just destined. So I went to the University of Florida. I'm like, ooh, this school is about to make me. And honestly, that school was what created this image that you all see in front of you as Dr. Archie Moss. You know, it was it was some rough times. You know, I remember mm-hmm. times where there were numerous police cars at, at my campus. We went through lots of different principles on my journey there. And I think that just showed me um, the need in public education, in urban education, the need for positive male role models. I felt mm-hmm. like I took on this disciplinarian role for a lot of the students out while I was in the classroom, even when I left the classroom, where I felt like I had to serve as this disciplinarian. I wasn't looked at as this instructional leader. I was looked at mm-hmm. as this disciplinarian, which I feel like is what the box that a lot of Black males in education fall in, and we get placed there because we have the presence. We have the voice, as they like to say, the kids listen, but we also add value in the classroom. You know, yeah. people don't talk about I had the highest math scores in the district. They don't talk about that. They mm. talk about my classroom was orderly and my kids were quiet. Mm. And so I think I learned in that journey that there was so much more I could give. And I felt like I just knew that being a teacher, then when I moved up to being a dean of students, there was so much more I wanted to be able to to, to give to this, this field. And I think that's what led me to want to become a principal um, I went through a principal pipeline program, New Leaders, uh, which was probably the best professional development that I've experienced, really helping me learn those blind spots that I had, helping me learn how I could be a more effective leader. And I think that's what brought me to Memphis, Tennessee, where I was able to serve um, as a principal um, for five years at my school, Bruce Elementary School, um, where I was the youngest principal in Chevy County Schools and also the first Teach for America alum to lead a school. And so I knew that there was, you know, 
that was a lot. You know, there was there were folks that were they were looking at me, looking to see how I was going to perform. And I knew I had to perform well if I wanted to bring up others behind me. So I think that whole journey from growing up to being a principal, um, it was all about proving people wrong. Mm. I think folks doubt your abilities. They doubt what you're capable of. They look at you being young. They look at you having braids. They think that you're not capable. They think you're supposed to be the most well-read. And I tell people all the time, like, I'm never the smartest person in the room, but I'm the hardest worker. And I think that's that's what drove me to kind of continue this work. And I think what has continued to drive me in this work that I'm doing even now as um, a school design partner with Transcend, where I'm able to coach school and district leaders on school redesign and innovation. And so the work that I think I thrived on as a principal and the innovation and the the -the out-of-the-box, non-conventional ways I was able to lead my school, I'm actually now able to coach other school and district leaders across the world to do it, to make sure school is more equitable for all kids. And so that's in a nutshell, you know, my (laughs) journey, um, you know, to get to where I am, just really been all about doing the work for the kids that we serve. And you're doing it, right? And doing it on so many levels and such at a, like a fast but efficient pace. So one of the things um, I heard you point out in your journey that I feel like is super interesting, and we talk about this a lot um, here on this platform, is how people try to put you in a box um, as a Black man. And I think that's such an interesting point to pull out because, again, being the youngest principal, having the highest math math scores, but the accomplishments that gets highlighted is like, he does so well with kids because probably, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mr. Moss, he don't play, you know, he don't play with the kids Mm -hmm. in the room. But I mean, he doesn't play from a sense of, you know, culture and behavior, but he doesn't play from a sense of academics. Why? Because I'm pretty sure you set high expectations for your students academically and supporting them and meeting those expectations. But the fact that people remove that narrative from a black male educator story is that they're actually educators. They yes. teach. <laughs> how, <laughs> That's what they do. How did they get here? Yes. Um, because they're educated. They can teach. Um, and I, they can teach some of y'all under the table. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think because when we think of across the nation, only 2% of the teaching profession are black, black male men. educators. That's so right. it's like there's so few of us and the need is so high. That mm-hmm. I get, I get why it happens. I do, but just because it's so easy to reach out to that black male educators down the hall and be like, "Hey, you want to coach?" Because I did. I coached basketball. I coached track. I coached football. You know, I did do all those things. But that was because that's something I enjoyed doing outside of my classroom. But let's come in and have a conversation about what I just taught in this lesson. Let's talk about how my kids just mastered this, how they perform so well on their integrated yes. assessments. That's the kind of conversations. And I think it goes to speak to this box they put in. And I think it, I go back to this story where when I was leaving the classroom, I had the opportunity of being a dean of students, um, which was all about culture and discipline. But I also had the opportunity of, there was also opportunity for me to be an academic in, uh, coach. But they chose to put me in this, this dean of students work, which I did great in. But how much more impact could I have made with my students that look like me had I been able to coach teachers in improving their math instruction across the building? But again, mm. that box is always placed because they see one thing at the time. They think that orderly classrooms, quiet classrooms, or classrooms where kids are learning. And I think what I've learned on this journey is that, no, just because my classroom was quiet, my principals left me alone, I could not have been teaching a thing. But because yeah. my classroom was in order, my kids weren't misbehaving, they assumed I was doing work. And I think that's how lots of students aren't getting the pushes that they need to be really successful because we view education or we view compliance as proficiency and it's mm-hmm. not. And I think mm-hmm. we got to make sure that we get in there and understand that educators look differently, engagement looks different and making sure that we push them in all aspects of, of you know, not just behaviorally, but academically and socially as well. Agreed. And, you know, some of that is born out of the need to want to police black children. Oh, um, yep, yep, yep. And, you know, the classroom is quiet. So even when you're saying, you know, it's an assumption that folks are doing proficient for work. Sometimes it's like, <laughs> I don't even care if you are. Are these kids quiet? Mm-hmm. Are they seated? Um, and that's all I need and, and all I want. And it's funny as I'm hearing you talk and I'm I'm thinking about, you know, there's an option for you to be a coach 
you know, in an academic sphere or to be the leader of, of discipline and culture and climate. And that's what they chose for you. But it also goes to show, and I do not think this gets highlighted and lifted up enough, and which is why we need to recruit more Black men. It also goes to show the multi-talents that are possessed yes. by Black men. So the ability to be able to do both. So the ability yes. to be able to not only teach, right, at an extremely high level, but the opportunity that Black men take to build relationships with children. Again, knowing how to hold kids accountable, having high standards, but still support them and support them with love. Um, yes. And understand everybody can't do that. Um, that's yes. a skill. That is a talent. Yeah. So when you have a, a, an administrator that can only fit in this particular box, they can only coach teachers, but they don't know how to build relationships with kids. Yes. That also says to me, if that person is coaching people on academics purely, how are they going to reach the kids if they can't teach somebody how to love the kids? Yes. So, and I think that's also a point that I always mention. You know, I mentor lots of male educators across the nation currently, you know, about, you know, they're interested in being a school leader, going to school leadership. They're like, ooh, you've done it so young. Like, what'd you do? And I always tell folks, it's very simple. Perfect your craft. Mm -hmm. I think it is so critical. We're, sometimes we get so gun horn, like, I want to move up. And, you know, and sometimes it's for, you know, not necessarily the right reasons because we're trying to make more money because we know educators aren't paid what they deserve. Right. And so folks, a lot of black males, especially those grow up low income, you want to go into a profession leaving college that you're going to make some money because you might be paying back student loans. You got a family to take care of. There's so many things you have to pay and people don't see teaching or education as a lucrative field. And mm -hmm. so they're like, Ooh, how can I move up? How can I make more money? Ooh, I got to go into school leadership. But it's like, how can you be a school leader going back to your point? If you weren't a good teacher, yes. Like, what were those scores looking like? Mm -hmm. Well, like how are you gonna how are you gonna stand in front of your staff and tell them you need to be doing this in your classroom when you couldn't do it yourself as a teacher? Sure. And then on yes. the other end of that, you might have had those phenomenal scores, but did the kids like you? Thank you. Did anyone enjoy being in your presence? You mm -hmm. know, and I, I'll be really honest and transparent that my first year as a teacher, my kids did not like me. Mm -hmm. I'll be very honest and say that. I went in and I was I was like, y'all gonna get this math. Y'all gonna mm -hmm. learn this math. Y'all need to like me. Y'all gonna respect me. And I got 90% of my kids to be proficient that year. And I was like, job well done. Let me pat myself in the back. Mm -hmm. But I realized that next year, those kids didn't come back to visit me down the hallway. Mm -hmm. Those kids would turn their heads at me, ugh, roll their eyes <laughs> because I didn't build relationships. Yes. I didn't connect with them as people. I was viewing them as just a number that I had mm. to get to reach that next level. Mm. And I knew in that moment that I needed to make a change. And so I changed my entire practice. So I made sure I did a little bit more to really get to know my kids, to build those relationships. And what I found out was, oh my goodness, you'd be surprised. The results still occur. You know, they occur yes. when you build those relationships, but people don't want to talk about it. They sometimes want to have this sense of urgency, yes. which sense of urgency brings in that white supremacist culture talk where you got to have it. things done and people don't want to talk about that that sense of urgency leads to you producing more industrialized environment for students mm. and I realized I had to hold a mirror to myself and realize that and I think it really hit me you know deep down after those kids you know went on to graduate high school mm. and like one of them I got really close with but like I will see his classmates and I was like, oh, you know, so excited to see them, you know, graduate. And they weren't looking excited to see me, see me, you know, and it was just like, wow. It was in that moment. I was like, I did not make a lasting impact on their lives. Yes, I helped them learn some math, but it's so much more than just that. And I think we as black male educators and educators in general have to understand there needs to be a balance in how you support the academics with the behavior, with the social development. And I think that is what we got to do to make sure our kids get what they need to be successful. Oh, you bring up, when I tell you just hearing you speak right now, I got goosebumps um, because you bring up something that is so key and so important in terms of having that balance and your ability to have that personal self-reflection about mm. that, which people really struggle to do that. Adults struggle to do yes. that. Like we do. We really do. And for you to admit, like, them kids ain't like me. And they <laughs> At all. <laughs> you kids ain't like me. And you know, you'll get people real quick, real defensive. Well, I'm not here to be their friend. And it's not about being their that, friend. Yeah. It, it's really not about that. And and also having the, the, the state of mind to say, like, you know what? There actually could have been a different math teacher in here. And these kids possibly could have thrived. 
Because again, yep. when you put the onus back on them with their own ability to learn, they haven't, right? And you believe yep. that kids can learn, they will. But Absolutely. how much would that have been for them to say, like, I had an adult in that room who actually cared about me, right? Ooh. Who cared Ooh. about me, who cared about what I was going to do in life. And again, you probably did care about all of those things, right? It's not that yeah. you did it, but the way you showed it and the way you chose to build relation- relationships created that block that, you know, sometimes Absolutely. you just can't come back from. And when you reflect on that, that's that's never what you wanted. That's never what you wanted for those kids at Correct. all. Correct. But we go and we train teachers with that mindset, right? Like, <sighs> you're not here to be their friend. Hey, you here to learn. You here to teach them this. That, we gotta that whole... close the achievement gap. Yeah, yeah. There's so much work. The kids are they need this. They don't have time for all of that. And I'm yes. just being honest. Like that philosophy and that mentality that I had as a teacher that that I developed because it wasn't there initially. The the, mm-hmm. the philosophy of like I need to make sure that my kids experience pure joy in my mm-hmm. classroom mm-hmm. because joy is freedom and yes. it's liberating. Yes. And I feel like when that happens, I feel like that's what education should look like. And yes. I think that I didn't have that coming in as a teacher. And they're, they're not, like you said, they're not teaching that in any programming. They're not t- teaching you to instill a sense of joy in learning and teaching. They're mm-hmm. not. And so I think I took that new philosophy and that's honestly how I led as a I principal, which didn't always, you know, make people feel good, you know. <laughs> and when I say people, you know, those outside of my school building, mm-hmm. um, you know, because I would, you know, take some time to devote to advisory, to devote mm-hmm. to celebrating my students, yes. to devote to recognizing my students and my staff. I would take time because my logic was either I take the time or, or the kids going to take it on them, their own. You know, they're going to require that we do things that meet their needs. And I felt like, why not give them that space and the opportunity to experience that joy and that fun? I feel like that's how I led as a principal. And I think because I was such a different, you know, way of leading, you know, folks questioned that. Mm. I'm already young, so I already got that on my, on my you know, against yes. me. Um, I got braids, you know, which people, there's an image that people think principals are supposed to have. Yes. And I didn't fit that cookie cutter image. I'm not coming in in a suit and tie. And I'll be really honest, not, I feel like I've spoken about this, about this a lot more now mm-hmm. because I'm on the other side, side of it. Of it yep. Like I had to cut my hair to get a job. Mm, that's I terrible. The right image as what they said principals look like. And so mm. I did. I cut my hair. I had the low boy, had my clean cut fade. You know, I stopped wearing my bow ties. I started wearing neckties so oh. that I could fit this mold. But when they handed me those keys, the first thing I did was grow my hair <laughs> back. Grow your hair back out. And, and it's so interesting that that small thing, which, which was like, like they say joy is an act of resistance, that act of resistance against what they thought this white normative culture, which Memphis is not white normative, but they were they were subscribing to these to white it. normative culture. Yes. Um, when I started showing up authentically me, my kids started showing up with their braids, showing up with their hair, experiencing just joy, like running up to me, telling me like, I got my hair braided like you because I want to be like you. And like to have kids like look at you in that way, that's that's the impact. Those kids are going to remember me. They're going to remember how I led. They're going to remember that I supported them. They're going to remember that I was hands on. I coached the basketball team as a principal. I coached the step team as a principal. They're going to remember that I was hands on. I coached intervention with students. Like mm. I was hands on because I need to let my teachers and my staff know we in this together. Yes, the there is it. an There is a gap in instruction and knowledge. Mm-hmm. Like absolutely, but just drilling down on the kids and thinking that we drill and kill them with this math and reading instruction is going to get them to miraculously learn all the stuff that they didn't learn previously isn't going to solve the problem. We got to make sure these kids love coming to school every single day. Cause that's half the battle getting them to show up. Yes. Like you said in the intro, showing up and showing out our kids got to show up and show out. <laughs> yes. And so I think that ultimately we had to get them the opportunity to like get them excited about just showing up to school and now that they're here, we got to teach them. Teach and I them. think that was just the way the, my, the mentality that I just had to adopt along the way that kind of goes against what they deem working in a Title I school that when I first took over was in the bottom 10% of the state. Like, I knew that there was an urgent need. Like, I knew that. Mm-hmm. Believe me. I, mm-hmm. I saw the numbers when I took over, but I also knew I was going to do it my way to lead to those results. And ultimately, we were able to get there.
Listen, beautiful, beautiful. And what you saw was that those kids were deserving. You saw that they were deserving and you gave them what they deserved. And I think a lot of times we don't look at poor black children as deserving um, Mm -hmm. because we also look at them as the problem. Oh, you not reading proficient? There's something wrong with you. Not yep. that, again, they done been through these many years of education with us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're still not proficient. <laughs> Somehow, you know, that, that glitch is on the child, you know. Mm-hmm. They've been through years of education with us, but that glitch is on the child. But what you saw is somebody that was deserving, children that were deserving, um, and children Absolutely. that were worthy, and you created an environment that matched that. Um, because you said yes. it right. They should love coming to school. Why shouldn't they? They should love the people who lead and teach them. Why? Why shouldn't they? And when yes. they give that love, we have to do our job, and that's teach, yes. and that's teach. And I love that about you that you were the 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 basketball coach. Uh, you were leading intervention. All of that is super super important. Um, my time in K twelve, I taught basketball. I'm taught. I coached basketball. I coached basketball for about eleven years. But I felt like it was important to do. Number one, I, I'm a lover of the sport. But number yes. two, it builds a different sense of credibility with the kids. And it builds yeah. a, a different type of relationship. So even as you tell the story and a journey of you, really what you were doing was like, I'm going to get this job and I'm going to come through this door and be authentically me. And that's Absolutely. important. And that's important for kids to see. And even as black people, we subscribe to like this very hetero, hetero white normative culture um, in every aspect of these of these jobs. And we mm-hmm. know that education is super pervasive. But Absolutely. we use the language, right? Like, Kids can't be what they can't see. That's it. So, but if I'm a kid, right, and I like my braids or I like my locks or I like my dreads or I like to like look scruffy or whatever, like that's just my look. It's like, so you telling me that if I can't be me, I can't hold a position of leadership. Insane. Mm. No matter my intelligence, no matter my capability, if I don't look a certain way, I can't be that. Insane. So Uh, thankful that you chose to be you. And that kids got an example of what being you looks like, right? My principal wears braids. My principal plays ball. You know what I mean? My principal is interested in some of the stuff we're interested in. My principal is a person. He's a a human. Like, and I think I'm so happy that you said, and I appreciate that because I felt like a cop out, to be honest, when I was applying to get the job, because I did Mm -hmm. do what I need to do to get the job. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like, how can I coach other people, other educators, other teachers and tell them like, be you authentically. You don't change who you are. You know, if that job, they don't want you because of you, that job ain't for them. How can I continue to coach and preach that to others Mm -hmm. when I didn't even do that myself? Um, And I always think about, but I, I felt like I saw opportunity that I wanted to get in the door. I had to get a seat at the table. And I I joke with people all the time. It's like, I need a seat at the table. And like now I tell folks, you know, I, I, it's this little joke. I was telling one of my colleagues at Transcend, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't like, I feel like I've, I'm very humble and mm-hmm. I feel like everything I've done, I've worked for. And there's people around me that have lifted me and mentored me and supported me along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that I've accomplished a lot in my lifetime. And so when I'm interacting with people and people tell me, oh, you have so much potential. Oh, I just think you're going to be great. I'm like, I'm going to be great. <laughs> like it's one of the moments where I'm like, <laughs> Like, they're like, you bring so much to the table. And I literally stopped someone. I said, I don't bring so much to the table. I am the table. Hello. Hello. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome to, thank you for being in my presence. And and that's not me. That's not how I orient. Mm -hmm. But I felt like there were moments where I was like, I have to celebrate myself sometimes too. You know, I'm so humble. When people start talking about the things I've accomplished, it's, I get real eerie. Like, please stop talking about me. Like, it ain't about me. It's about these kids. It's about this work. Like, I always put on this work. But it's like moments where I'm like, okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna, you know, sell me short yep. and not give me my flowers, I'm gonna make sure I take them from you and let you know, like, no. And so I think that's also the thing with like black educators, black male educators in general, like toot your own horn sometimes. Yes. You know, walk in those rooms being confident. Walk in knowing that this job is already yours, yes. regardless of what these people have to say. Even if they choose to look over you and go with somebody else. Like, just know that you are qualified, you are worthy, you are enough. And I think that was something that I had to constantly tell and remind myself that I am enough. And I think that's what I just instilled in all my students, that regardless of whether you don't know something, you have a learned disability, you're struggling in this area, you're dyslexic, regardless, 
you are enough mm-hmm. and we're going to continually grow to be better. Yes. Listen, all of this work and all this impact it and, and putting it back on you do this and you do this for the kids. You are leading um, an organization right now called the Gentlemen's League. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization yes, and why yes, you started yes. it? Yes, the Gentlemen's League is like literally my baby um, that started off as an idea. Um, so the Gentlemen's League is an all-male mentorship program that seeks to educate, empower, and enrich um, our youth and lead them to um, a life of success. And so ultimately, like, I just want to give a little backstory. So when I was a teacher in Charlotte, um, I actually had the opportunity to intern with the zone super t- with the superintendent's office. And we had to come up with a passion project for the summer based on, you know, data, statistics, things that we we're passionate about. And I noticed during that time frame that the black and brown boys in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools were struggling academically. They had the highest suspension rates and the lowest attendance. And I was like, wow, we got to do something to kind of like get students excited to come to school, to get them the support, get them, you know, the mentorship that they need mm-hmm. to kind of move forward. And so through that summer project, I was able to build out the Gymnast League, which started off as just a club that was operating at my school. Um, and so when I was at Whitewater, it was just a club. I had about 80 boys that I was supporting, which was way too much. So when you're starting off projects, that is way too much to do when you are still a full-time teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but it was just this privilege that I felt like I had where I had told the staff that if you have issues with my boys, because they are my boys, mm-hmm. if you have issues with my boys, come to me before you send them to the office. Mm-hmm. Because again, the whole premise of it was to decrease the school to prison the pipeline and to make sure that we were removing those barriers and removing and decreasing those suspensions and the offenses that our students were facing. And so the teachers definitely took ownership of that and they would send them boys. So I'll be in the middle of teaching and two boys will walk through the door and they'll be my mentorship boys. And I'll be like, have a seat. I'll deal with you later. I will <laughs> teach my lesson, release the kids and then go deal with them, send them back to class. And honestly, although it took a lot on me and it was like, you know, I felt like a burden at some point. It was like, wow, this is a privilege Mm -hmm. that I have to intervene in the lives of some of our at-risk youth to get them on the right path. And they trust me. They believe in me. They respect me enough to listen to me to go back to their classroom and take care of business where they wouldn't get in trouble anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved over to Memphis, I was like, wow, this project, it got to come with me. You know, I, you know, I believe in it. I feel like it's important. And so when I moved to Memphis, I started it off um, when I was a resident principal at one of the schools here. And my, my mentor principal at the time, Dr. Kevin Malone, was just like, are y'all a 501c3? Like, you got to make this legit. Like, you need, to, you need to monetize this. Like, this is, there's, so, there's so much great work happening that you need to do. So I went through that process. And in 2016, I started the paperwork. But we officially became 501c3 in 2017. And I, and I share that because it, it also speaks to the drive I had. Like, I was persistent on doing this myself. Mm-hmm. I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm, I'm trying to create a nonprofit organization. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like 26 at the time, but like, I knew I had a passion for this work. And so it was a long year working mm-hmm. with the IRS to get that paperwork together. But I feel like getting that final determination letter from the IRS saying that we're official 501c3, there was so much joy in that, knowing that I did this. And so again, it just speaks to, you put your mind on stuff like there's nothing that no one can take from you. You can't get it done. You yes. don't need to be the smartest person. Like I've said, you don't need to know. You don't need to have experience running nonprofits or running the business. Like go out there and figure it out Alex. and learn and make mistakes as I did <laughs> and learn from those mistakes and make it happen. And so currently um, we are working with four schools here in Memphis, Shelby County. And we're so excited that next year we're expanding to five additional schools. We're expanding to our first high school. Um, so we're really excited because ultimately the work is just making sure that we decrease the school to prison pipeline. I think that we really want to make sure that we're um, creating a cradle to career pipeline mm-hmm. that looks very different than the school to prison pipeline. So how do we expose our young men to positive male role models? You said it already, like they can't be what they can't see. I always joke. Um, this is a funny joke. I always tell, like I was born on the same day as Tiger Woods <laughs> and I joke with my mom all the time. I'm like, I could have been Tiger Woods, you know? <laughs> I could have been really great at golf, but I was never exposed to it as a child. Mm. I was never taught that this is something I could do 
when you turn the TV screen at the time, there weren't black men playing golf. Mm-mm. So if I don't see black men playing golf, why would I think that's something I could do? Exactly. Like, oh, it's not in our DNA must be, you know, you gotta, you know, you can't have too much melanin to play golf. You know, that's, these are thoughts that, you know, people might think. Yep. And then I could have been really good at that. And so I think my goal now is to ensure that we expose our kids to so many different walks of life. Maybe they want to go into you know, comedy. Maybe they want to be a doctor. Maybe they want to be a lawyer. Maybe they want to go into radio. Maybe they want to be a social media influencer. There are so many different professions that are out there that I think it's our job and duty to bring those jobs to the lives of our students. Um, Because I also think about, you know, when I went to, when I went to college, I don't know what an engineer was being really honest, Mm -hmm. you know, and one of my friends, my roommate at the time was going to school to be an industrial engineer. And I'm like, I have the slightest clue what that is. He's like, well, I really, you know, a lot of the class is about math and science. I was like, well, I like math. Mm. Like, why not learn about that? And so it's like, there's money out there, yes. money to be had. And I think that if students aren't exposed to these things at, like I said, an early age, then they don't know that they, they can aspire to do these things and more. So I think that's ultimately what we do with the Gentlemen's League. Um, is really trying to instill in the youth, um, develop them social emotionally, develop them holistically, mm-hmm. provide them with that peer support to really ultimately make sure they get what they need to be successful. Yes, I love this. And I love that it was like your passion project that has now turned into like a real organization that is like real life yes. impact. And you said it, man, the determination and really being able to be disciplined and being focused. Mm-hmm. And again, what that's going to do for so many children. I love the fact that you guys are expanding to high school um, because that's important. That's big. And I always feel like sometimes our secondary babies, especially high school, are like that lost, that kind of forgotten crew. Um, Mm -hmm. And people feel like once they're there, they're there. Like, well, that's it. Like your life is going to be your life. But I think intervention and disruption goes a long way for those for those young men um, as well. I agree. I agree. And I think we had been working like initially I was like, this is a middle school project. Like I really want to do this middle ship, middle school mentorship program um, because, you know, it could middle school at that time where kids are still trying to figure out who they are, what they want to be like, we get them on track, you know, but what I realized is that we support kids. Now we have elementary schools, we have middle schools. And then we give out a high school scholarship. So basically what we, what we were saying was we're going to support you K through eight. Good luck in high school. We hope you make it. Mm -hmm. But if you do make it to being a senior, we got this scholarship you can apply for to help you with college. And it's like, where is the support that we're providing these students in high school, which is where they need it the most, where they still need the development. They still need the mentorship. They still need the the pathways, the access, the opportunity. And so I think that's why I'm really excited. We're really excited to be actually moving into a brand new school here in Memphis, um, University High School. That's which cool. is through the University of Memphis, um, where we're actually starting with ninth grade. So we're actually having the opportunity to build out our program from ninth grade on up. So each year we'll add in a grade. So I'm really excited to be able to, number one, you know, develop this curriculum because what the needs of high schoolers are very different than the needs of middle schoolers. Yes. But ultimately, these are the grades. The, those are the years that I think our boys need us the most um, because it's just specifically here in Memphis, um, we have one of the highest disconnected youth mm. percentages. Those, those youth ages 16 to 24 who are not enrolled in school and not enrolled in a job. Mm. So we can only make our own inferences about what they're doing and how they're making a living. But like that's happening with these kids that are in these high school ages. And so what are we going to do to make sure that we prevent that from happening and that we can support our students in making sure that they have the opportunity to understand that, you know, college is an option. But it's not the only yeah, option. option. Like, right. what is this job that you might be interested in? What is this trade you're interested in? Are you interested in going to the military? There are so many opportunities for the youth that I feel like we just have to tap in and make sure we expose them to them. Definitely. So for young Black boys, why do you feel like mentorship is so important in their growth and development, right? Because people do things all the time to, you know, work to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. Um, but you keyed in on mentorship. And some people struggle with like figuring out what does mentorship, what what is mentorship, right? Like, what does that look mm-hmm. like? How do you mentor somebody? People struggle with trying to figure out um, kind of what that looks like in a programmatical sense. But I would love for you to talk about one, why is it important uh, for the growth and development of young black boys? 
Absolutely. And so what's so interesting about that was like, because this question that you even just raised is a question that exists across the world. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually my dissertation topic was on um, the actual title was hashtag Black Boys Matter, yes. dismantling the school to prison pipeline through implementation of school based mentorship programs. It was a mouthful, but it was a lot of information um, that was really defining what mentorship looks like. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately what we found out um, in, in my dissertation in general, I can use a lot of the research from there. We did actually three different studies. We did a study with um, the boys that were in our mentorship program who had been in the program for a minimum of three years. We did a program, I mean, we did a study with their parents and then we did a study with their mentors. Mm. And again, we were able to find three different, you know, things as to the, the, as to why mentorship matters. Number one, we realized that there aren't males in the schools. Mm -hmm. And so again, how can we, you know, there is something about showing up to a school and seeing a leader, seeing a teacher that looks like you, seeing someone that yes. you can relate to, seeing someone that's been through the struggles that you've been going through. We know what's happening when we turn on the TV and we see the police brutality, we see the lives of black boys and black girls that are always being taken mm -hmm. at an early age. And so how do we continue to pour into the youth to let them know that they truly matter, their lives matter? And I think mentorship is how we do that. So a lot of our boys talked about not having, some of them not having fathers at home. But I think that's also, you know, uh, sometimes a stereotype that people think that all the boys that we support don't have, don't have daddies at home. No, that is a lie. Because mm -hmm. I was in a mentorship program and my dad spent my life my whole life, mm -hmm. you know? there's something about showing up to school. Like you might need, you have your dad at home that's probably gonna take care of you, support you, pouring into you. But when you're in school, you need that sometimes even more mm -hmm. because you might have situations where teachers don't believe in you. Yes. You might have situations where peer pressure is getting the best of you and you don't know how you're supposed to respond. Yes. And you need someone at the school level to support you. And I think that's what's really unique about um, the Gentlemen's League is we pride ourselves on being a school-based mentorship program versus being a community-based mentorship program. We live within a school community mm -hmm. because the accountability that exists being in a school building is what our boys need. Yes. We oftentimes think that kids don't want to be held accountable. Not they true. do. Yes. They want to know that somebody's watching they do. them. Like there was so many times as a principal that I'd be like, I'm watching you. I want to make sure you're doing good. I, I, I make sure you know that I got eyes on you at all times. And literally the next day, they'll be like, you didn't come check on me. I thought she was watching me. And I'm like, yes. oh, wow. Oh, okay. I'm coming to see you later. Okay, I got you. Yes. No worries. The kids yes. want to know that someone is watching them because in their mind, that translates to you care, you care. about You're me invested as a in me. person. Yes. You are now invested. Yes. And that's what mentorship is all about. It's about establishing those authentic relationships that sometimes there are lots of similarities, but sometimes across lines of differences mm -hmm. where you see something in someone that's a little different than you and you want to be, you want to learn from that. You want to be developed in that way. So we have the mentorship aspect, but we also have the workshop aspect where we're really instilling some of these skills that students need to be successful. You know, we have conversations about what does it look like, you know, dressing for success, you know, and showing them that there's different styles doing it but not thinking of that you got to have a suit and tie and that's what success looks mm -hmm. like. Showing them that you could wear your J's, your jeans, your button up, your blazer, and you could still be fly and dress for the occasion. Yes. So like really teaching them all what it's like to just be growing up as black boys. And I think that's what mentorship is all about. It is about meeting the kids where they are, hearing them. I think what's lost in this day and age with schools is that we don't listen to what our kids mm -hmm. want. We don't hear them. We don't literally hear their needs. Nope. And I think now I pride myself on making sure that all people, not just kids, because the adults and the teachers that I work with have to feel this way as well, but all people have to feel seen, heard, and deeply known. And if we don't allow that to be the premise or at the forefront of the way that we lead, we're going to have a hard time getting people to follow. Yes. And so I think that is what mentorship has been about. It's been about pouring into the lives of our youth making sure they get what they need, holding them accountable, checking on them. I think that's what's able to happen when you have a school base. You know, if little Johnny get in trouble in math class, his mentor down the hallway, what do you think that teacher going to do? She's going to go tell little Johnny's mentor. mentor. And guess what little Johnny's mentor going to do on his break? He about to come have a nice little conversation with little Johnny. Yep. And now Johnny knows, dang, they watching me. 
dang, okay, I can't mess up no more. Dang, I can't do all these things. And so we hold them accountable, but we also award and celebrate them. So we, you know, give them academic incentives. So they meet these marks. We're going to take them to Grizzlies games. We're going to get on these gift cards. We're going to take them on field trips. So I think it's all about supporting, celebrating, instilling, and pouring into the boys. That's all what mentorship is about. And I love this concept of, again, creating mentorship to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. I think you've been, you know, Dean of Students, so in charge of climate and culture. And what people don't understand sometimes is like, once you make that call to the Dean, like Mm. I have to do what I have to do in that role, right? For for a number of reasons. One, like um, there's a certain job structure that's shut up that that employs me to do that. The second part of that is the minute that I don't do that, you see me, meaning like the other adult who called me, as giving the kid a break or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm not doing my job. Yeah. Whereas when you have an alternative option to like, okay, we're not going to call the Dean. We're not going to escalate this to that, that level, but you do need to have a conversation with someone that's going to talk to you and hold you accountable and help you make different choices. And I think that yeah. sometimes people feel like the Dean can be utilized at both. And it depends. It depends on how people's school cultures are set up, but folks need to know, mm-hmm. like, because of how people are placed in these disciplinary roles, once you call yeah. me, there is a protocol that has to be followed. So yeah. I got to call the parent. I might have to give a consequence, whether that's a detention mm-hmm. or whatever. Because the minute I have a conversation with a child and send them back in the classroom, you're like, you ain't doing nothing. You just feeding them cookies down the hall. So, yeah. yeah. It, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm actually so happy that you brought that up because that is why I was in that position for a year and I had to get out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually called that year as a dean of student the year of the harder darkness. Mm. Um, and I called it that because I went into that role to instill change. Mm-hmm. And what I did, I became a product of my environment. Yes, it turns you into and that. And I was supposed to be the teacher that was helping to liberate our Black boys. Mm-hmm. And what I actually did each day was continue to stifle to their growth them. and their development. Yep by continuing to they send them to me just like you said like when you send it to me my hands are tied my principal's telling me send them home yes i got a protocol so what am i supposed to do i got to do my job and so what i was doing each and every day was sending home the black and brown boys that looked like me increasing those suspension numbers increasing increasing those access numbers how am i someone who experienced that as a child teachers picking on them, you know, mistreating them. Mm-hmm. And like, I got into this work to to combat that, to do something different, to be the change. But yet when I was given an opportunity, I didn't actually exert as much as myself to advocate for the needs of my kids. And I think that was where I realized in that moment where, you know, I had a conversation, you know, with, I had a frank conversation me and my old principal um, have a great relationship now. We're able to openly talk about that. But I felt like I was the oppressive system that I was fighting against. Mm -hmm. And again, I had to acknowledge that. So as you can see, like I'm very reflective on like the (laughs) mistakes that I have personally made. Like I was suspending the black boys. Yep. And now I got a mentorship program trying to combat that. So like I gotta acknowledge (laughs) that. I don't want nobody coming saying, well you was the same one that used to suspend me. I was, I did suspend you. You're right. But I've learned and I've grown and I've realized that I didn't have the positional power at the time to create the change that I felt like was necessary for the kids I was serving. At the end of the day, I still had to answer to people Mm -hmm. above me and I couldn't change it the way that I wanted to. So I was like, you know what I did? I became a principal because then the buck Mm -hmm. stops with me. And now I'm making sure that when you send kids to me, the school must be on fire Mm -hmm. because we've given kids so many chance and opportunities to get it right that by the time you get to me, now we're going to have to have a conversation with mama because we don't try 10 different things mm-hmm. beforehand and it's not working. But I think because I was able to now be in a position to evoke change, I think I was able to make it happen. But I even still push myself in thinking now, how could I have still advocated for what I felt like was right? Yes. And so folks that are in these Dean of Students roles, like don't think because you're not the principal that you can't make that change. I didn't have the courage mm. at the time to do what I need to do for those kids. And I feel like young not not to say young, just black males that are in those disciplinary roles, use your position for good. Yes. And it's so and great. advocate. So if this is at the forefront of what you want, if you believe in black boys and you don't you don't you know that you want to combat this, 
then you're going to have to be, you have to be unapologetic about managing up to those above you to let them know like, yeah, no, I don't feel comfortable with this. So if you want to suspend them, you can, Mm -hmm. but it's not on me. And I think I just wasn't there at that point. But I think now I'm in this position where I could look back, be very retrospective and be like, absolutely, I made a, I, I, I had a mishap there. But I think now, now that I know when you know better, you, you do better. That. And now that I know better, I'm going to continue to push people forward to do that work. I mean, the bravery um, in your statements of admittance, right? Like, because some people can't and they don't. Um, I can. I have admitted that I felt like I was a part of a system of an oppression when I was in mm. uh, culture and climate. And I did my best. For me, right back then on skirting around a system or try to implement other things. And like mm-hmm. you said, like it, you, you, you take on battles with people. Yeah. Uh, you take on real battles with people. And one of my largest and hardest battles was, you know, I would always get told we feel like it's you and the students like against us. And for me, it's not, it's not what I'm doing here, uh, but I'm yeah. also not your, you know, your advocate only. You call me. I don't have to be on your side. And it's like, but we're a team. We work Mm. together. Yeah, but like we're in service to children. So I Mm -hmm. have to be in service to children. I have to be in service to their families. Like I have to be in service Mm -hmm. to their parents. Like I have to ensure that there's fairness um, in what's happening and what's going on. And definitely we already know that the culture and climate system is overpopulated with black men, right? Being in charge. But are you in charge? No, somebody is using Mm. you to, again, police black children. So you point out uh, something that's super like pervasive in, in, in education. But I'm hoping that um, Gentlemen's League and other organizations like yours can be an alternative to disrupt those cycles. Yes. And I think that's super, yes. super important. It just is. Absolutely. It just is. And I think like the biggest thing that we've been doing now is like, even as we've been expanding to additional schools, we've noticed like one of the schools that honestly applied to join us have 90 staff members and one male staff member of color. So then you look at that like, when you look at that, like, so who is providing mentorship guidance, being a role model or being an example um, to these young black boys inside that school? And I know. And it's like, those, those are those schools where there's the, there's the need is so much higher because they don't even see it. Like I think back when I, as a principal, they had me, my counselor was a male, mm. black male, you know, one of the, we had a black male teacher, we had black male assistants. Mm-hmm. There was like in any area that you turned, there was a black, there was man. A black male. So it's <laughs> yes. like, okay, I could, there's somebody who I could talk to, you know, there's somebody who I could relate to, you know, communicate with. But if you think about a school with, and if you know, if you got 90 staff members, I mean, this is a pretty large school. Yes. So that's like a thousand students. And out of a thousand students, there's one male black male. So you got to think of the burden that's placed on him. Yes. The 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 con the, the, the like guiltiness that he feels when he sees his black students not doing well, and he wants to intervene, but he's like, "Oh, it's too many of them. I can't support them all. What do I do?" And so that's honestly why they applied to add a chapter to the gymnast league mm-hmm. because they want to. They acknowledge that there is that they aren't doing what they need to do to serve their black boys, and they want to be able to make sure that they're decreasing some of those suspension rates. And so I think about that. I'm like, now the work, you know, has to occur where. We got to also get more black males in the profession. Like, and like, I'm been trying, working yes. so hard to show folks that I promise you, it is the most fulfilling work I have ever done. Um, you know, if, if I had to go back and be a teacher for the rest of my life, I would absolutely be do that <laughs> because of the joy that you experience. Kids are funny. Let's be real. There's never a dull moment. No, You're going to have stories that no one will ever believe. <laughs> like there, like I could talk about teaching and education till I'm blue in the face because of the experience that you just have and just the opportunity, you know, to go back. One of my first students. So I, I talk about, you know, this story and I share this story a lot when I try to encourage folks to go into the profession. So my first year, I already mentioned that kids ain't like mm-hmm. me. No one liked me. I actually had the opportunity of teaching an honors class my first year, which I'm like, y'all going to get a first year teacher to teach honors kids? But okay, <laughs> I'll figure it out. And there was there was only like three black boys in the classroom. So of course, I'm already drawn to them. So I'm like, you're in an honors class. That's like me. I see myself in those mm-hmm. kids. And I remember one day at lunch, you know, one of the black boys had an oatmeal cream pie, you know, little Debbie, you know. And 
I was just joking with him, trying to establish a relationship. So, like, I reached around, I grabbed the oatmeal pie, like, like I was going to take it mm-hmm. from him. And he just looked at me, looking all crazy, like, what's wrong with you? And so, I didn't think nothing of it. I put it back, and, you know, we never talked about it again. A few weeks later, we had a, a test. And at the end of all of my tests, I would ask my students, like, they got a free response. Just say, like, what would you like to tell Mr. Moss? You could talk about anything. And he wrote, and he was like, did you find that oatmeal pie that I snuck into your lunchbox? He had snuck an oatmeal pie in my lunchbox that I knew it was there, but because I eat them all the time, I didn't think anything of it. But he literally snuck an oatmeal pie in my relation in my lunchbox, and that's honestly how our relationship started. Nice. It started over an oatmeal pie, and I actually just last month went to watch him walk across the stage at the University of North Carolina Chapel oh, Hill, congrats. where he graduated. <laughs> where he's now moving to D.C. to become an educator. And so I think those stories, you don't realize the impact that you have. Like, that was so simple. Mm -hmm. He was the one student that liked me (laughs) that year, you know? And it was all about oatmeal pie, like literally something so trivial as a snack Mm -hmm. that built the bond with one of us, with each other, that has gone on to have a, we've had a lasting relationship where now, like, I'm like his godfather. He calls me his uncle, dad. Like, we, we have this fun relationship now where he went into being a teacher and an educator because of me. Yes. I was his first male teacher that he ever had. And so just think about the students that you can impact and the students that you can build these lasting relationships with. You might not always see the fruits of your labor overnight. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see them in the day. You're not going to see them at the end of the year. You're going to see them when years go by and these kids reach back out to you and tell you, you believed in me, you care for me, you showed me what was possible. Those are those moments that still, you know, may give me chills and make me feel like, wow, I don't care about being on the Ellen show. I don't care about all these recognitions and things that I might have accomplished in my life. These kids come back and tell me that I made an impact on their lives. That is what satisfaction, that's what joy is, that's what accomplishment feels like for me. And I think that's what being in a classroom and being an educator and being a black man educator is all about. So like we definitely, those is listening, like, y'all, if you've been thinking about it, do it, you know, (laughs) just do it. You know, you never know like the impact that you're able to have on the youth. And we just need more and more male educators to get in those classes. Dr. Archie Moss Jr. Serving leadership at his finest. You hear me? being of service and the impact that we can make on these kids. That was such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. Um, But what it makes me think of definitely, I think was rewarding um, for being a black male educator is looking at the impact that you have on kids. But as a leader, what is the best way that folks can support black male teachers? Because I think that a lot of folks are inspired to be in the in the profession, they come in, they, they're they excited, they want to have relationships, they want to make an impact on kids, and a lot of them do. But then they're leaving after two or three years because, like, mm-hmm. I can't. Like, the, the system, like, I don't feel fulfilled. Like, I don't feel whole as a teacher. Um, mm-hmm. How can leaders support Black male educators? I think, ultimately, huh, what my leaders didn't do for me my first mm-hmm. few years was they left me alone, which I was appreciative, you know, as a young 22, 23-year-old teacher straight out of college, like some of the practices that I had in my classroom were definitely <laughs> unconstitutional, I'm going to say that. Okay? Questionable. Very questionable. Okay. <laughs> um, but they left me alone. And so I was never developed. I was never pushed. Mm. I was never, you know, made to believe that I could be anything more than what I was doing in that moment because they left me alone because my classroom was orderly. So I think we have to stop putting black male educators in these boxes and thinking that this is what they're supposed to do. This is their lane. Mm -hmm. Like, no, allow these black male educators to get the development that they need. If they do want to go let PD because they are interested in being the data analyst at the school, Mm -hmm. allow them the opportunity to be able to explore those options. If they do want to go the disciplinary route, how do we allow them the opportunity to just be able to explore and, and be able to thrive in those environments? And I think ultimately what we have to do is we have to develop the adult social emotional well-being as well. Mm-hmm. Like I think about there's so much development that our black male educators need themselves because they're not getting it at their schools. They're not they might be the one or two only black male educators on their staff. They don't have a network. Mm. And so typically they just want to have those outlets. So I oftentimes ask folks like, have you asked 
your educators, what do they need? What type of supports do they need? Do they need support? Right now, what I've been noticing in the work that I've done with um, mentoring male educators, you know, it's been so difficult for a lot of them to pass their certification yes. exams. So like, how do we put money and resources into getting them, their male educators or those that are aspiring, the support, the tutoring, the resources to be able to pass those um, exams? How do we put in front of them some additional alternative certification programs in front mm -hmm. of them? How do we begin to, you know, provide, remove some of those barriers that exist in getting our male educators in the classroom? I think that is what we need to do. And then once we get there, support them, give them what they need, take care of your people. I was a firm believer as a principal that if you take care of your people, your people will take care of your kids. Mm. And that is what it is. And so some folks would always tell me, you do too much for your staff. You always doing something for them. You always like, they should, you could, they could do stuff for themselves. I'm like, they can. But if I could take something off their mm. plate, so all they got to worry about is teaching my kids, that's, that's all that matters. matters. And so how do we create those environments where our black male educators can thrive? Like, let's say a black male educator wants to be this master teacher, but they're interested in coaching. They want to create these clubs. They want to start mentorship programs. How can you support them in getting all that done? So many times black male educators just feel like they're out here in isolation. They're out here by themselves. They don't feel like they have a network or a community to support them. And so as leaders, we have to, number one, support them in the direction that they want to mm -hmm. go in and not limit what's possible for our black male educators. But then two, we got to allow them the opportunity to make mistakes. Yes. I think so often um, black male educators, we, you know, we're young. We sometimes don't do things the right way the first time. We might say things wrong. We might make, you know, make bad choices for how we want to operate or orient ourselves to the work. Don't throw us out, you know, yes. from that first moment. Continue to build That's with great. us. Continue to support, support. us. Um, and I think that is where we, what we need, like giving them the mentorship that they need. And if you don't, if as a school leader or as a community, like you can't provide that support or mentorship, help them find someone, mm -hmm. help them get tapped into organizations that are supporting male educators, um, giving them the development that they need, building them up, you know, make sure that they're aligned, that the work that they're doing is aligned to their passion. Yes. And I think that is what black male educators really need to be able to thrive and be successful is just the open, honest support and the ability to make mistakes and learn from them. Yes, y'all hear that. And what rang true through everything uh, that Doc was saying was support, support, support. Talk to these mm -hmm. Black men to find out what they need. Don't assume they need a certain type of support. Have a conversation, mm -hmm. acting with, ask them what they need, ask them what they want to do. Um, and another thing I see is when you see something in them, tell them, push them, and support yes. them to be that. Support them to get there. Cause sometimes it's black men like, yeah, hey, I'm here to teach. I'm here to impact these kids. But you're like, you know what? You actually would make an excellent leader. And they're like, me? Yes, you. Let me show you how to get there. Let me tap you on the shoulder. Yes. Let me drive you through that. Literally just had a conversation maybe, what, two days ago with um, our CEO of the center, Sharif el -Mekki, And he talked about how he never thought about becoming a principal. Like that just was never his thing. Mm -hmm. um, and his his principal at the time was like, hey, I want you to go to that principal certification meeting. He's like, okay. He said the first meeting they had, mm -hmm. he didn't go. Um, principal saw him, why didn't you go? Oh, I had a bunch of kids in my room. I was tutoring, you know, I just couldn't make it. He said the second one that week, the, his principal was like, so you're going to go, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll go. He said the principal's meeting, the certification meeting came up. Of course, he was in his room with a bunch of kids. He said his principal came through with boxes of pizza <laughs> and was like, hey, I'm going to cover uh, your tutoring session right now. I got pizza for the kids. You go on down the hall, go to the certification meeting like I told you to go on and do because I want you to, you know, get into this. I really think you would make a great principal. So seeing things in black men, supporting them. That, <laughs> that is, that's what it is. Like I think about, you know, when I wanted to become a principal, I told you I went through the program New Leaders. Mm -hmm. And we did a year of residency, which I think these type of programs are the programs that I think help black male educators thrive. Mm. Because I was um, assigned a mentor principal here in Memphis um, who we were leading the school together. Although I'm mm -hmm. learning, he was allowing me the opportunity to learn from him, but allow me to lead. Mm. And there were so many times where I remember parents would come in with complaints and he would like literally lead off the back door and leave me. And I'm like, 
dog, like, why are you leaving me? I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but it will force me to act. Yes. And it was those moments of those hands-on experiences. Some people could learn how to be a leader. I mean, they talk about you learn going to these classes and reading about mm -hmm. it. No, put me on Experience. the ground. Let me be in front of these people. Do it. Make in front of real folks, yes. real situations where I'm forced to act as the leader. And I'm going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say things wrong, but now I got this support. I have this mentor that's going to support me and make sure I get what I want. And I get the result that I'm desiring. And I think that that whole professional development experience where I'm holding up a mirror and they're telling me, you know, you didn't do this really well, but you were great at this. We need to hear yes. that. We need to know what we're doing well at so that we know that this is the lane I need to continue down. And this is an area that, ooh, you need to strengthen this. Like the way you sent that email, you know, you might want to, you know, tighten that up a little bit. I'm like, okay, I'll be a little nicer. <laughs> Hello. You know, you, you learn these things along the way, but you got to have folks that are going to be open and honest with you, but that are in your corner. Yes. Like they're open and honest because they want you to be better and they see better in you. Mm -hmm. And I think my mentor here in Memphis, Dr. Kevin Malone, saw something to me that sometimes I didn't see in myself. And he believed in me and he pushed me. He said that you're going to be this prince. Yes. I know it. And it, because people support you in that way and pour into you and give you those flowers, you feel like you have no choice you but to step it. in and walk in what's yours. Yes. And so I think that's what has to happen for these male educators. As I well. love this mentorship disrupting, okay, the school to prison pipeline. So we are coming to a close. So what we love to do before we close out is give our guests the opportunity to thank a black teacher or thank some black teachers. So I'm definitely going to give you the floor to be able to do that right now. Oh, yes. So I always I actually dedicated part of my dissertation um, to these two individuals who I'm going to thank. And that is actually um, Mr. Carzell Morris, who was actually the first black prince, male principal that I had. Dope. He actually was a father figure to me at school every single day when I didn't want one, when I was in my little naive, <laughs> uh, resistant stage, he would not let me fail. Mm. He would not let me fail. Sure. And when I became a principal, he was the first person I reached out to to let him know I did that because of him. Awesome. And then the other person is um, Mr. Calvin Nixon, who was my fourth and fifth grade teacher, the very first black male teacher that I ever had he showed me he we were his first set of class we was his first class when he started so he was young he showed me the archetype for what a great teacher looks like he pushed those academics but he developed relationships where still to this day he still teaches at the same elementary school <laughs> i was at and when i go home to miami i still go back to visit him because he is what put in my mind this image of what teachers are, look like and how their role is so much more than you stand in front of the classroom, grading papers and teaching a lesson. It is those relationships and those lifelong um, like lessons that are being taught that help develop the youth as they grow older. So I always give kudos to those two, Mr. Um, Morris and Mr. Nixon, who literally inspired me to be who I am today. Yes, I love that. They inspired you and you in turn are now inspiring others through the work that you do. Yes, Doc, yes. we appreciate you coming on today and hanging out with us. You have dropped so many gems today for us all to listen to just about education impact, education leadership and mentorship and all of that. We really thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come on Building the Back Educator Pipeline podcast. Thank you so much. No, I appreciate you for having me. Most definitely. Any closing words to our guests before we close out? I would just say, everyone, you know, feel free to follow the Gentlemen's League if you want to support. We're always looking for sponsorships. We have a huge Boys of Color conference that takes place every spring here in Memphis where we support students grades 3 through 12. And so if you would like to support um, the Gentlemen's League, you visit our website at thegentsleague.org. Uh, but really, just stay tuned for this additional great things happening um, with the Gentlemen's League and just with myself in general. Love it. Listen, everybody. Thank you, everybody out there for listening and joining. We'll see you next time on Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. Peace, y'all.